Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Dallas Center. It's great to see you all. Welcome all of you watching online. And uh, we're glad to have you here with us today. I know uh, my dad is watching online there, recovering very well from heart surgery. So thank you all. I know many of you have asked about him and he did just great. He's home uh, doing well. So thanks for all your prayers and thoughts and um, he's doing just great. So um, we welcome all of you in the power of the creator, in the peace of the redeemer and in the presence of the spirit. We have a few announcements this morning, um, the, um, Ed, his hip surgery, his hip replacement surgery is this Wednesday, June 1st. So please be in prayer for that. Um, it'll be with Iowa ortho, Dr. Bleacher, Beecher, something like that. And, um, I'm his, uh, let's see, it's called joint camp coach <laughs> for three straight days in the hospital and at home. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I will not be in the office, but I'm available by cell phone. So text me, call me. Um, I'll be checking my emails. Um, so if you need me, uh, don't hesitate to call. And uh, if anyone plans to drop off any food or anything, just give me a call and we can coordinate. So that'd be great. And then um, make sure to look, actually read your newsletter this week, please, and look for emails. We'll have some new announcements coming out that are important for you all to read. And then um, community fun nights are something we're going to have new this summer. Um, we'll have one in June. We're finalizing the date there in June and one in August. It's going to be here on the property, um, outside and inside the fellowship hall. Free food, games, activities for the whole community, for families to come out and have fun. It's like VBS on steroids is kind of what we're doing. We're partnering with the Methodist Church, um, and we're doing two big nights throughout the summer. So uh, we'll have more information on how you can volunteer and help with that. Uh, there'll be lots of different kinds of opportunities, but if you know you'd like to help with that, you can see Chris or Cindy for that in advance. So I think that's all I have. Does anyone else have any announcements? This morning? Okay, let us worship God. to worship before and after first, first and last, last alpha and omega the steadfast, steadfast love of god, of god endures, endures forever, forever. alleluia now our opening song christ is made the sure foundation
God of power and might, let your love shine on us and through us to others. Take the blindness from our eyes and our hearts. Give us the joy of knowing and serving you in all that we say, think, and do. In Jesus' name we pray. And now we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please hear the call to confession. Having defeated sin and conquered death, the rise in Christ beckons to us, welcoming our confession and promising new life, trusting in the promise of the gospel. Let us confess our sins. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, you have shown yourself to us in Jesus, perfect in every way, compassionate and kind, faithful and loving, gracious and hospitable. We stumble and fall as we seek to follow him, struggling to make his ways our ways. Our sins are real and they are many. Forgive our failings and encourage us to start again. Amen. In 1 John 9, 1, 9, we find the most wonderful truth. When we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means that everything that has gotten in the way of your relationship with God has been wiped clean and made new. The moment that you ask, even before you ask, it's made new. God's mercies are new each and every day. So hear the good news that you are forgiven and be at peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. May you share the peace of Christ with one another. Mm -hmm. Peace of Christ with you all. So we have a special part of the service today. We get to ordain and install Sarah Wilson as an elder, I'm sorry, as a deacon here um, at our church. And so if Sarah would come up, I'm going to have her children participate with us today (laughs) as part of the children's sermon. (laughs) So guys, y'all want to come and surround mom? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can put your paper. (laughs) So there are different gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are varieties of ways to serve God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through people in different ways, but it is the same God who inspires a faithful response. Each one is given gifts by the spirit to use for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ. So today we present Sarah Wilson to become a deacon in our body today. Her statement of ordination, we are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked by Christ owned by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our Lord Jesus. 
within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordaining of governance of the church, and for preaching of the word and celebration of the sacraments. So for deacons representing the one universal church, the session of First Presbyterian Church of Dallas Center now ordains Sarah Wilson to the ministry as a deacon and installs her to active service in our congregation. And your constitutional questions, which you will recall, you took several of these um, as a confirmand. They're the very same questions that your mom will take as a deacon. So Sarah, in baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by God through the voice of the church for new service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledging Him Lord of all, head of the church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church, universal, and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. I do. do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I do, and I will. I do, and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, say, I will. I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, say, I will. I will. And do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church, pray for, and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, say, I do, and I will. I do, and I will. So will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. I will. And to the congregation, do we, the members of this church, accept Sarah Wilson as a deacon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. Do we agree to pray for her? to encourage her, to respect her decisions, and to follow as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? If so, say, we do. We do. All right. Well, if all of you will stretch your hands out to her, and if you guys will just put your hands on her as we pray for her. <laughs> Gracious God, we ask you to pour out your spirit upon Sarah, whom you've called, you've baptized as your own, your daughter, called by your name. Grant her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Help her to rely on the gifts of your spirit and to follow Christ faithfully in this calling. Give Sarah a spirit of truthfulness that she may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living and rightly govern your people. Pour out your spirit of power and truth upon this whole church that we may be for you a holy people baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain your church and ministry. Help us to be effective servants of the gospel, living together with the transforming power of your grace in life together, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So Sarah Wilson, you are now a deacon ordained and installed to the ministry of service and care in the church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. Amen.
<laughs> Yay! <laughs> Celebrate, celebrate. <laughs> Thank you for answering the call. <laughs> Illumination. Yep, that's right. And now for the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the son of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garments around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed into the followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there were fish with, there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back in the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the, his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Thanks be to God. Well, when I say the words life alert, you probably remember the words help. I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> you remember that commercial, right? It was very bad acting and bad, uh, you know, production value, but very good marketing results. You know, you can, you can hear that all over. People use that in different campaigns. But I think <clears throat> that idea, the reason it was so popular is I think we've all been in places where we have fallen and we couldn't get up ourselves. You know, maybe it's poor health or a relationship that ended a decision we made out of anger that kind of blew things up, a job loss or a betrayal. Any of these can knock us to our knees, make us feel stuck, um, unable to move forward. And our life as a follower of Jesus Christ isn't any different than this. Just like Peter, our very best intentions, no matter what they are, we fail Jesus, We'll deny him. We choose our own path. We try to take the easy way out every time we get a chance. We want to change, and we really try repeatedly over and over again in our own strength. But ultimately, our own nature bids us to run away and try to hide from the consequences of sin. And Adam and Eve started it, you know, from the very beginning. God came looking for them in the cool of the garden after sin had entered in. Adam, where are you, my son? He's already hiding behind the bushes. We run from the intimacy that we were made, we were created to be involved in, the relational intimacy we were made for. In to me see. You've probably heard that before. Intimacy, in to me see. And we put up protective shields in our lives all different ages. It starts in middle school, basically. It probably starts before that. We determine that, oh, it's really painful when people see who I am and I get rejected for that. So I find a way to put up a shield so that people can't see into who I really am. And, you know, maybe we go above and beyond with kindness. And it's not that we're not kind people, but we really have no, we deny all of our own personal boundaries 
and just say yes to everything and go above and beyond. Um, but really underneath, we're hiding our own feelings of inadequacy and judgment towards ourselves. Maybe you protect yourself by presenting always the very best version of yourself, always together in front of people, business only, always intellect, polished, while underneath, you might not even recognize it yourself, but you wonder what value you even have. Maybe well, your own significance or does your voice even matter? But you present to others the projection of what you want them to see. Vulnerability is very difficult for you. And just like all of you, I do it too. We all do. We're humans. <laughs> you know, I'm a little more self-aware now that I've gone through lots of schooling as a pastor to not do so much of this. Um, so I don't pass it off on to all of you. But I try to catch myself more often. But as a pleaser, I am known to like completely betray who I am as a person in order to become who you need me to be or who I think you expect me to be in any known situation. <clears throat> I'll jump through hoops that were not even made for me to jump through in order for me to please. And I, it doesn't, you know, I'd love to just remain myself 100% of the time and who cares who doesn't like it. And I'm growing in this, but I, that's the area I struggle in. We all have ways we protect who we really are. And so even though we fail and fall and sometimes outright completely just walk away from God altogether, God doesn't leave us in our sin, in our failures or our fallen state. Thank God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Instead, you know, as we discover Peter here in the text, out on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, he, just like Peter, he encounters the living Christ that transforms him. This encounter with Christ also transforms us. It is the very thing that self-development and motivational speakers and all the things that the world offers, they're good things, but they can't really transform you from the inside out. Only the risen Christ can do that. And Peter, God love him, he is so impatient that Jesus tells him, just wait and I'll tell you what to do next after he rises from the dead. And Peter just can't wait. He says, hey guys, <laughs> Let's go back to what we know to do. Let's go fishing. That's my career. I don't want to sit around waiting. Let's find something to go do while we wait for Jesus. You know, let's keep busy. I don't know why it's so hard to sit and be still, but it is very difficult for all of us. We're very similar to Peter. But once we experience this abundance of the mercy of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, we are never the same, just like Peter was never the same. We rise into this deeper experience of discipleship. We move from just churchgoers, from members into disciples and church followers. I mean, in Christ followers, sorry. When I look at measures of church health, one of those things that you look at is whether a church has a clear practice of lifelong disciple making. Or do we just have simply teaching good morals, offering the latest programs to meet the needs of a consumer culture of churchgoers? You know, people who come and they want all of these things in their church. And so we create all of those things to please the people who come here. Or do we really focus on making disciples? Lifelong discipleship formation is about daily life. It's about how we practice our faith how we proclaim our identity as followers of Christ, how we grow in our faith, cherish our faith, pass it down to others, share our faith in the world. It's beyond mere words, and how do people know we are disciples of Christ? No matter the age, it's about daily seeking and living in relationship with the living God. We are called to be righteous, to seek justice, to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Lifelong relationship and discipleship formation is about how we live into that right relationship with God and all of God's people and all others. It's about growing in the community of God's grace, the church, and interpreting faith in our context, in our everyday life, confronting the brokenness in our lives, not running from it, 
not covering it up. We all have it. We're all broken. When we fall short of the glory of God, looking into God's faith, face, knowing that we are accepted, we are called, we are beloved. It's about the call to take up our, cro our cross and follow Christ, not to just show up on Sundays or not show up on Sundays. Through this Come Follow Me series, I have really tried to focus on, this is the last week of it. We're coming to Pentecost next week. Yeah, try to wear your red. <laughs> Pentecost is here and the Spirit comes finally. Um, but I've tried to focus on the idea of true discipleship and what that should look like in your, our daily lives, how that can be reflected in our daily lives. So the text today really shows us that catalyst for how this discipleship begins and evolves, the spark that it takes that turns a member or a church intender into a hungry, God-seeking, passionate disciple of Christ. And for Peter today to change from the one who claimed not to know Jesus, remember he denied him three times to save himself from shame and possible harm, and he was completely transformed almost overnight into the apostle that stood before thousands declaring his faith in the risen Christ. I mean, he went from one type of a person to a totally different type of person. And how did that happen? What was it that changed him? We have this same catalyst in our life. And it's when we run in to the risen Christ. When we experience the power of the risen Christ in our lives through the living spirit of God, we are transformed. You cannot walk away from an encounter with the risen Christ and be the same. You just can't. And you will exist differently in the world. And that might look like maybe, you know, you should experience consequences, but you're given God's grace. You really have messed something up in a relationship, but you're given complete and total forgiveness. And it's not pushed back in your face later on. You know, there's so many different ways. A situation is difficult, but just the grace to go through it is there. All these ways that we experience God's grace in the midst of our living today, the living Christ, that's the catalyst where we, when we experience it, we are changed. And we want to become more of a disciple. We want to dig into who this Christ is and how can we become more of a follower in the world instead of just showing up and being a good person, right? We want to be transformed. So as they fish in the story, Peter grabs his buddies. They can't stay still. He's got to go do something his own way and his own strength. They fish all night long and nothing. They caught nothing. No single bite, no tug, nothing. Until the first light peeks over the horizon. They see this stranger come and calls out from the seashore. Little children, he says, sweet, innocent, misguided, good intentioned friends. <laughs> Just throw your net on the other side of the boat. And they didn't have anything else to do, so why not? Suddenly, not one bite, not one tug. Not one single fish, but a whole school of fish. So many that the nets were straining. The boat started to tilt and sink to one side. So many that their arms strained under the weight. An abundance of fish. And in that moment, they realized who it was that really called them. It was the Lord Jesus. And they saw no longer in a moment of scarcity and there's not enough. They didn't see through those lenses anymore. They all of a sudden saw that as the risen Christ is among them and they follow his timing, his instruction, there's abundance. It's more than enough all around us. Their attitudes, their hearts, their faith, it was changed, transformed in one moment when they recognized Jesus was with them. Even though Peter faltered, even though he had previously abandoned Jesus, Jesus still calls out to him. He still calls out to each one of us. And that love, that forgiveness, that invitation is what we call grace. And it's that grace that transforms us as disciples of Christ. Christ's mercy transforms us. I recall a time when this spirit of abundant life and transformation took hold in my home church through a precocious little two-year-old named Piper. And uh, she was born at this church during the time that my husband, Ed, was the pastor. 
And this church was kind of, um, I, I guess we could say dying and declining at the time. They, they liked their worship experience, very quiet and reflective and not a lot of movement or noise, very proper decorum and solemnity. And Piper, she began to kind of, you know, squeal and scoot all over the floor and she would yelp and she would kind of disturb. You, you can imagine she would disturb some of the members and you could just see the horror on her mom's face, you know, just freaking out as like, what do I do? You know, knowing that people are probably saying, why doesn't her mother do something or remove her from this service? You know, uh, Piper seemed to disturb their worship experience more than enlivening it until one morning, <laughs> Piper was starting to walk, and she was getting at that walking age, and Ed was up there just preaching, you know, like he does, and here comes little Piper just walking up to the front, and she's like this, and Ed didn't skip a beat. He just grabbed her up, continued preaching, and just walking, continued preaching, and she's just looking up at him, and ah, you know, just watching, listening, and didn't say a word, just was enthralled in the whole experience. And Ed, in that moment, it was just a moment of God being there. Ed lived out and modeled. It wasn't about Ed. It was about Jesus being there in that moment, modeling for people what the kingdom of God looks like. It's not about how you behave in church. It's about, you know, a little one coming and just continuing on. And this transformational spirit really began to change hearts and minds there. You know, older members began to ask for Piper to sit with them. And then it moved from that to this whole thing where they created this discovery zone because other parents liked having their children in service with them after this whole thing. They realized, oh, nobody's going to get mad at us for our kids like being wiggly or whatever. And so they stopped sending them out to a separate class and they created this whole little area over here called Discovery Zone. Kids had blankets and pillows and they sat all over here. And then they had adults that called pioneers that would volunteer each week and sit among them. And they had little activity packs that would go along with the message. And it was known that there was going to be movement and talking and questions asked over here because the pioneers would engage with them. And it just became part of the culture. And if you were bothered and did not enjoy that, that was okay. You could move over to this side of the sanctuary and you wouldn't be bothered. It would be totally fine. So it was, there was grace for both sides of types of people. And all of this began with one little girl getting loose from the grasp of what behaving in church looks like. And she became the example of what freedom in the spirit was all about. And it just reminded me as I, as I was writing this sermon and thinking about transforming from one type to another type and how when we recognize how Jesus is actually risen and living among us in each and every day life and everyday situations, that this kind of transformation can happen in all types of situations that we're faced with. And so the same transforming power that moved Peter from fear to joy is available to all of us. The transforming power that enabled him to recognize Jesus when he saw abundance instead of scarcity is, ab is available to all of us. The transforming power that changed the hardened, cynical hearts when they saw Ed pick up little Piper and preach with her in his arms is available to all of us. To take you with Jesus to a new place of forgiveness, joy, and mercy, all you have to do is jump out of your boat. I don't know what your boat is, or what you need to jump out of. But see Jesus in the abundance that surrounds you. And respond to him with unrivaled abandon. Not out of fear and scarcity. But knowing that God is there to meet you. God is the one bidding you on. Can you see him in yourself and others? Do you hear him calling to you and to our church? I'm certain that Jesus is moving among us in this season and has many great plans for us here at this church. I do see the winds of change and hear the call of the Spirit among us. When we see Jesus, let us be a people who do something about it. Let us become the church that God is calling us to be so we are ready when it's time to welcome all those whom God is sending our way. 
How you respond to this call is entirely up to you. May you be transformed by the spirit of grace. Amen. And let us respond. To the hymn that is in your bulletin. (laughs) Sorry, I can't find it right now. (laughs) Let all mortal flesh keep silent. Sorry. God gives us the blessing of being able to work, earn, save, spend, and accumulate wealth. We do this for our our children. We do this for our community. We do this for ourselves. But we also do it to honor God as faithful stewards. And as stewards, we joyfully worship God each Sunday by giving back to him from what we have earned so, so that the church can do meaningful work for God's kingdom in the world. Would you join me in worshiping God as faith as faithful stewards through through, through giving? Please stand for our doxology.
Eternal God, take and use these gifts for your purpose in the world, giving food to the hungry, hope to the despairing, and new life to those who need it. Teach us to live each every day for you so that future generations will know your goodness and praise your glory. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. It is now time for joys and concerns. My concern is all the families um, of the folks in Buffalo, I believe, as well as Uvalde, um, who have lost very dear family members. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, I have a couple of concerns and a joy. Last Saturday, we left with Gary to go to Colorado and on our way out there, Melvin's sister Donna called and said, I'm losing my husband. And on Monday, he passed away. So I would ask for prayers for Donna. So Gary dropped us off, and we met Melvin's brother Jerry and his wife to spend five days with. The second day we were there, my sister-in-law, Judy, stood up, passed out, fell, and broke her neck. So I would ask for prayers for Judy and Jerry and their kids. Then I have a joy. Yesterday, a friend came to our door and gave us two wedding cake cupcakes to help us celebrate our 55th anniversary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And there are none on Facebook. Rejoicing in God's promise of new creation, let us pray to the maker of heaven and earth. And God of new life, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, help us to see and hear your call to us, and give us the courage, imagination, and energy to act so that we may become all that you are calling us to be. God of new life, hear our prayers. We pray for the world. Let us take a moment to celebrate your goodness, O oh Lord, even in the midst of such horrific pain and senseless killing again and again and again. You are present, and you are still good. Hold tight the families who are numb with grief and sick with loss. Put salve over their eyes and ears and hearts of those little ones who witnessed it all and will carry the trauma of that day always. Heal them, God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for this community. Send us to our neighborhoods, to the streets, and to porches to just sit and listen a while in order to understand and hear the stories of those who live among us here in Dallas Center. Help us to be good news to all that we meet here, to share the gospel with all who are longing to be set free here. God of new life, hear our prayers. We pray for our loved ones. Guard their lives the ones that we love so much. Rescue them from the grip of suffering. Let your healing light dawn upon them. Let them feel that you are near. God of new life, hear our prayer. Gracious God, keep us from running away. Keep us from apathy and disillusionment. Help us to remember that we carry your light and peace everywhere we go. 
and that your transforming power is always available to us. Open our eyes and ears, especially when we are most stubborn. Keep us close to your throne of grace where all mercy is found. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. May you stand for the benediction. <laughs> and since this is our last week of the Easter season, let us proclaim once more, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. <laughs> Now go out into the highways and the byways of your life and compel the stranger, the overlooked, and the forgotten to come to God's house with you to taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. The world needs to experience God's goodness more now than ever before, so don't be shy to extend the invitation. Go now in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.